2021. So good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this uh, event, which is part of National Heritage Week 2021, where we're having a look at Longford's wetlands. And we're joined this evening by uh, Dr. Patrick Croshall and also Mary Catherine Gallagher, both of whom are from Wetland Surveys Ireland. Uh, Wetland Surveys Ireland are the leading wetland surveys company in the country, as the title might suggest. And they have been working with us here in Longford County Council for the past number of years, uh, since 20, 2017 in its entirety, in uh, recording and documenting um, the wetlands of County Longford that are of biodiversity potential. Um, so the format for this evening is that Mary Catherine and Patrick have a presentation that they're going to share with you. And then we'll have a short uh, discussion and Q&A session towards the end. So over to yourselves. So uh, uh, Patrick and Mary, uh, Mary Catherine, thanks again for joining us. It's great to see you, albeit virtually. And uh, I believe you were saying earlier, Patrick, that you've actually started the surveying here in Longford this week. <sighs> That's right. We were up. Uh, we were up all week. We've done three days up there, so it was great. Got out of, got the boots wet again. So it's nice. Yeah, some <laughs> plenty of nice wetlands. So we'll we'll talk some more about them later. But I think Mary Catherine will start off and give uh, an overview of, I suppose, what it's all about and what why should we be concerned about biodiversity of wetlands and that kind of stuff. So I'll let you off there, Mary Catherine. Thanks. Okay. Um, just want to check if you can see the screen that I'm sharing at the moment. I can, yes. OK, perfect. Great. I'll get going. OK, so um, so yeah, tonight we're going to be talking about surveying Longford's wetlands. So just to start off, um, I'm going to do kind of a brief introduction um, about wetlands and why they're so important. So Longford has a wide diversity of wetland habitats. Um, you're situated in right in the heart of the lakelands and inland waterways region of Ireland. And I guess Ireland's climate and kind of um, topography in general leads itself to having a lot of wetlands, but your county and other counties in the Midlands in particular um, are really well situated to have a lot of these wetland habitats. So just for anyone who's unsure about what a wetland actually is, it's an area of land that's either permanently or seasonally saturated by water. So where the water table is at or near the surface. And sometimes they're also defined as places that have been wet enough for long enough for a specific community of plants and animals um, to be living there. So you get wetlands all over the world. Um, they include things like shallow coral reefs, mangroves, oasis, rice paddies. Some of the more common wetlands that you get in Ireland and in Longford are things like lake and river systems, turlocks, bogs, fens, heath, wet grasslands, wet woodlands. And so you might wonder, well, what's all the fuss about wetlands? Like, why are they so important? And like all ecosystems, wetlands provide us with a range of ecosystem services. So these are things um, or the benefits that people get from nature for free. And a lot of the ecosystem services that are provided to us by wetlands are really quite essential in our day to day lives. So one of the important things that wetlands provide us with are biodiversity and that they support life. So wetlands are home to a lot of very unique plant and animal species. So they are often uniquely adapted to coping with wet conditions, um, low oxygen conditions, nutrient poor conditions in some situations. Um, and you get these animals and also plant species that spend their entire lives in wetlands. But then at a broader level, there's also this really wide kind of web of species that may not directly live in a wetland, but are reliant on a wetland in some way. So some species might forage or feed in wetlands. Some species might rely on wetlands for a part of their life cycle. And in general, wetlands are also extremely productive places. So there's a lot of primary productivity. The base of the food chain um, is like very productive in wetlands and that supports an awful lot of life. And because of all of this, wetlands support really high levels of biodiversity. 
And as we know, our biodiversity levels are decreasing at an alarming rate. So any habitats that support a lot of biodiversity are extremely important. Wetlands also provide us with lots of really important resources. So one of the most important is probably clean water. So a lot of wetland plants like rushes and reeds are able to remove pollutants um, from the water and provide us with clean water, which we obviously need every day for drinking, washing, cooking, all of the essential things. We also get really important things like food, fuel, building materials and medicines from wetlands as well. And as well as all of those kind of essential daily things, there's also um, other ecosystem services wetland provide us with that maybe aren't essential to our day to day survival, but they make life a little bit better. So wetlands also have an artistic or an inspirational value. Um, you'll often see that wetlands are the focus or the, the topic in a photograph, a painting, poems, songs. They're often at the center of myths or folklore and wetlands have been really important sort of through the ages and you'll often find um, archaeological sites in proximity to wetlands as well. So they have a really important cultural value. Um, we all know that spending time outdoors in nature helps with our physical health, but also our mental health. Um, a recent study in the UK found that 65% of people said that spending time near water had a positive impact on their mental health. And they're actually trialing this new thing over in the UK called blue prescribing. So that's where a doctor can actually give you a blue prescription, which means that you should spend more time outdoors near water. And they're working with various wetland organizations to sort of organize this, this thing. So it's really interesting to see the value of wetlands being seen in that sort of aspect as well. Uh, wetlands also regulate a lot of different things. So wetlands can store carbon, so that helps to regulate climate. They can remove pollutants from the atmosphere, so they can regulate air quality. And they can store and slowly release water, so they can regulate flooding. So there's a value that can be put on all of these ecosystem services. It's obviously really hard to, to put a value on some of these things. Uh, because some of them are kind of invaluable in a way because they're so essential to our survival. But attempts have been made at putting um, monetary values on these ecosystem services. So as an example, the biodiversity in wetlands has been estimated to be worth 385 million to the Irish economy per year, just as an example. Um, and as well as the, the value of all of these ecosystem services, there's also the more sort of, I suppose, tangible economic side of it as well that you can see more directly, which is the jobs that are created around wetlands. And in Ireland, a lot of that is to do with the tourism and recreation industry. So, you know, that could be jobs directly linked with wetlands like tour guides, um, fishing tours, um, all of that sort of thing. Um, and then there's the wider Kind of knock on impact of that in the wider community as well with maybe more jobs in B&Bs, hotels, all of that sort of stuff. Unfortunately, the value of all of these ecosystem services often aren't really appreciated until they are no longer there and they maybe need to be replaced by an alternative and we see how much they were actually worth in the first place. Over time, wetlands have kind of been viewed as unproductive areas or wastelands. They haven't really been valued. And so a lot of wetlands have been altered or changed. They would have been drained or they would have been converted into what would have been seen as more productive land. And that meant that there was the loss of wetland habitat and also a loss of all of the ecosystem services that those wetlands could have provided us with. So this is a a quote from the Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention. So the Ramsar Convention is a convention to, or well, aimed at conserving and protecting wetland habitats around the world. And Ireland has been a signatory of it since 2010. And she says that our collective and overwhelming lack of awareness of the importance of wetlands has made them the most globally threatened ecosystem. Our future is inextricably tied to these natural environments 
but still they get the least recognition, including among environmentalists and policymakers who have the greatest influence for protecting them. So as you can see, we're kind of um, still have a long way to go in terms of really valuing how important wetlands are. And unfortunately, the sort of long held view that they were, um, you know, not important habitats um, is paying its price. So it's estimated that 35% of wetlands have been lost between 1970 and 2015. Wetlands are believed to be disappearing three times as fast as forests and 25% of wetland plants and animals are currently at risk of extinction. And a lot of these plants and animals are specifically adapted to live in wetland environments. So when they're gone, they can't survive somewhere else. They're completely gone. And all of this is coming at a time where we're becoming more and more aware of the impact that we're having on the environment. Um, the latest report from the IPCC last week about climate change was obviously quite stark um, saying how widespread and rapid and urgent the issue of climate change is but there was also a message from that report which was saying that it's not too late to still make a change to take action and just underlined in orange there I have um, a sentence which says strong and sustained reduction in emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases would limit climate change. And wetlands actually play a really important role in this. So wetlands are very important carbon stores and they actually store more carbon than forests do, even though forests usually get sort of all of the, the fame for being, you know, amazing carbon stores. In particular, peatlands, which cover just 3% of the world's surface, holds nearly 30% of the soil carbon, which is amazing. But the thing about it is, is that that for that to be the case, the peatlands need to be in good condition. So damaged peatlands or ones that have been cut or drained actually become a source of carbon and they're um, car sending carbon into the atmosphere. So they're becoming part of the problem. And as well as that, they can't carry out their other ecosystem services as well as they would have been able to. And it's quite expensive to go backwards and try and restore them back to their original condition as well. So the main pressures and threats that are facing our wetlands, the first two are really the, the key ones, I think, the drainage and changes in land use. But other issues that are um, contributing to the decline of wetlands are pollution and dumping, eutrophication, so the runoff of nutrients from surrounding lands, changes in water supply, climate change itself is a threat for wetland habitats and the spread of invasive species, which threatens our native biodiversity. So thankfully, we are getting to a place where the importance of wetlands is being um, is being realised to some extent, but I think there's probably still a long way to go. But it's really important that we do protect what remains of our wetland habitats and surveying is a really important part of that. So because wetlands have sort of been overlooked for so long, there's often very little information available about them. So it's really important to build up a picture of what we have, like these um, surveys that Patrick's going to talk about in a second, to see what wetlands do you have in your county? Where are they? Um, what area of land do they cover? Which wetland habitats are there? What condition are they in? What are the main threats facing them? And with that information, you can build up a really good sort of inventory of the wetland habitats that you have. Um, you can start to understand what ecosystem services they're providing and how important they are. And you can also see which ones are maybe most at risk and which ones should be prioritized for conservation and restoration measures. So I'm going to um, hand over to Patrick and he's going to talk in a bit more detail about the wetlands in County Longford and what we found over the last few years of surveying them. Okay, can you see that now? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, yeah, definitely, yep. Okay, from current slide. So 
just to show you this is where Mary Catherine left off. So um, as I say, I'll, I'll bring it down to Longford, I suppose, and the work we've been doing in Longford and everything that Mary Catherine has kind of gone through there is very valid and uh, and relevant to what we're what we've been seeing in Longford and what's happening there. And uh, I think it's a, a lovely introduction. So um, just to give you an idea of our involvement, uh, we've been working with more aid since 2017. Initially, uh, we were asked to do a kind of a desktop survey to review what's known about the wetlands in County Monaghan. So we would have done that uh, during 2017 uh, together with Ross Common, actually, as it turned out. But for Longford itself, it would have involved looking at uh, mapping data sets, a lot of old reports, ecological surveys, everything and anything, you know, information from Board Namona, from Quilcha, different stakeholders. And we would have gathered all that information and consolidated it into a database of, of known wetlands, I suppose we would refer to them, to them as. And we would have identified a total of 300 or 281 wetlands in the county or potential wetlands. Some of these may well not turn out to be wetlands if they're checked on the ground, but uh, due to drainage or whatever else. But based on the information we had at hand, we felt there was probably about 281, uh, which is about 20% of the county. Uh, that might sound like an awful lot, but it's from in an Irish context, that's generally why what what the land area that's covered by wetland is in and around 19, 20%. Um, 29 of these sites, so just over 1% of them actually, as it turns out, are protected within uh, designated sites or national designated sites, like special areas of conservation under EU Habitats Directive or natural heritage areas under the um, under Irish legislation. So I suppose that there isn't a whole lot of uh, formal protection afforded to wetlands, although it is getting stronger within the planning system. If you want to drain wetlands and stuff, so you're obliged to do certain assessments in advance of of, of proceeding. Um, but I suppose what we did find was that there was a very limited amount of information available on the majority of sites. So outside of those 29 sites that are protected, there's been very little survey work done prior to 2017. So like Mary Catherine mentioned, it's, it's very important that you get the, you can't really protect them or determine what needs protection until such time as you've looked at the resource and looked at the wetland heritage of the county and determine what's important and where does it occur and where are the more important sites and that kind of thing, just from a planning and land use perspective so that you can you can plan for the future. So that's the aim of the surveys that we've done um, since then, which are the field surveys. Uh, the main wetland types that we would have identified in the initial survey would have included lakes, marshes, turlocks, there's a couple of them in the county, uh, raised bogs, I suppose they're a big feature of county, uh, Longford, when you consider Corley and all that as well, it's, it's, it's not surprising. Um, cut over bog, obviously a lot of the raised bogs have been cut over a long time ago and some of these are recovering naturally in, in fact and that, that's what we're finding in the more recent surveys is that where peat cutting has kind of stopped you're getting a lot of the wetland communities coming back so that, that's interesting. Uh, there's the wet woodlands, reed swamp, these are just the different types of uh, habitats that are out there. Uh, so once we had that initial review of, of what we thought was there are 280 sites we've since then been um, working to, Mon to Longford County Council to do surveys each summer. So in 2019, we would have looked at 18 in individual sites, 11 in 2020, and this year we're out there again, we're looking at about 12 sites. Um, these are all prioritized based on um, kind of what's like, the more sites are likely to sustain higher biodiversity or the sites that are likely to be of higher interest. Uh, we were also prioritizing those sites that haven't been looked at in the past because we feel at least we have some information on some of the wetlands. Let's let's identify those that we don't have any information on. Um, so the survey is generally undertaken by two people in the field. Uh, we record all the data using iPads or digital technology. It's uh, fantastic. It's made our life so much easier than when we started off with hard copy maps and everything going to the field. It's hard to believe. So we're just recording all this data on, on, on the iPads. And um, from the data we record in the field, we're able to provide habitat maps, we're able to identify the threats and pressures on the site, the land uses, and also look at their potential for conservation enhancement. Um, so just to give you an idea as to what we exactly we're, we're producing following these surveys, this is a site report for an individual site. This is, just happens to be Killeen Lock in, in Longford. And uh, page one, generally, this is this exact same format of report for every site that we survey. So for this page one, there is just an overview of the, of the site with a photo or whatever. And then it's kind of the, the name, address and telephone number of the site who done, conducted the survey, the date, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, summary information, the substrate type, whether it's peat or, or mineral soil or whatever, um, and uh, the location within the catchments. So that, that general information is there on page one. Page two, a bit more information about the site, whether it's a value, why is it of a value, what's actually occurring out there. Um, so just brief site descriptions. The key to this, we feel, is keeping the reports very, very brief and succinct and just having the key information that you need to be able to assess whether they're important or not, I suppose, from the planning point of view. Uh, we record the various habitats, so they're listed there on the on the second sheet of the reports, and also the land use. So this site here will be used for cattle grazing, for example, as well as the, the wetlands surrounding the lake. Um, and as well, then if there's any impacts or pressures identified. So here, there's these codes are European codes, so they're kind of tricky. But basically what that's saying is that there's a potential pollution coming from, from agriculture. Um, we wouldn't know the intensity of it, but that, that's just from our, our, our observations on site. And then third page is just a list of species that would have been recorded during the survey. These are very much quick and dirty surveys. It's very an, an inventory. If there's more detail required at a later stage, well, that's fine. But for now, we just want to get a, a feeling for the wetlands. Are they of value or not? Are there any rare species jumping out of this? But it's certainly not intended to record every single species that occurs there or anything like that. Um, and then we produce the habitat map, so that just kind of displays the whole thing visually. You can see the lake there in the centre, surrounded by other wetland habitats like wet grassland or reed swamps around the edges of the lake. So that's what we produce for each of the wetlands we visit. Um, so you'd be uh, Longford will be receiving twelve of these uh, site reports this year for the for the wetlands we're visiting. Um, just an overview of what we've been recording over the last couple of years. I suppose it's not surprising raised and cut over bogs are the, are the dominant wetland type. Um, they're in varying conditions. Some of them are, are most of the raised bogs are, are very degraded from cutting and, and drainage and that. But as I say, some of the cut over sites are actually coming back quite, quite well. And the bog, I imagine in time, maybe within a generation, they will start growing again. And, you know, in, 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 over, over time, I think you, you will get peat formation. Um, so in marsh and reed swamps, they're common, particularly around the lakes and other habitats. We've also kind of getting a view of these farm ponds, which are very important really because they're within the agricultural landscape and they're a real refuge for kind of, of local importance for birds and, and um, various flora and fauna because it's important to keep a, a kind of corridor of these small wetlands throughout the wider landscape that species can move between. Uh, quarry lakes are something we're coming across, which obviously are, are disused quarries. They're they get lakes establishing there and certain wetland interest in some of them. And the Turlock, which is a seasonal lake. Uh, just some photos of the, some of the surveys we've done. The two upper ones there are those quarry lakes that I mentioned. You can see there's some reed establishment and stuff on the on the first photo to the top left. So they, they can establish into quite decent um, wetlands in time, perhaps. Uh, the bottom one there is an example. It's kind of a landscape view. It's, it, it looks a lot bigger than it was, but that's a farm lake, a uh, farm pond or a large farm pond coming to a lake. We surveyed that one this week, actually, and um, it's just very typical of, 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 of these kind of habitats. And I think, you know, something in the agri environment sector, like farmers often don't get rewarded or kind of incentivized to manage these habitats correctly. So I think that's something that the Department of Ag are moving towards maybe incentivizing farmers to manage these areas better. And I think it's certainly something in the next caps should be coming through in relation to wetlands. Uh, peatlands, as I mentioned, look a real feature of Monaghan. The top two there, you can see the one in the top left is a, is a raised bog we looked at last year. It's at the edge of the bog. It's uh, cutting would have been happening there recently enough, but um, it's, it's ceased now at this stage. And I imagine in time that'll establish quite nicely if, if cutting doesn't resume. Uh, top right is a, a raised bog where the peat has never been taken off the surface, but it has been drained. And this kind of site is really important at the moment. That is that is emitting carbon, just like Mary Catherine was saying, and it's emitting much more carbon than you could ever imagine, more than any industry in the area. So I think one of the easy gains for Ireland to try and combat climate or do our bit towards towards combating climate change, and it's an easy one to do, is, is to block these drains and all of a sudden this peatland is no longer emitting that amount of carbon within probably 10 years or so. You can actually halt the carbon losses from these, these bogs. And in fact, maybe another 10 or 20 years after that, you might even get carbon accumulating again. So 
I think in time, like Borden and are at this, as you're aware, but many of these bogs are in private ownership as well. And I think this is something that we're going to have to look at at a policy level in Ireland, is particularly as up until recently, these emissions from the bogs wouldn't have been considered in our national accounting. But I understand in the next couple of years that will be the case. And I think Ireland will have a be looked on as being quite a poor performer in relation to carbon emissions when they consider the amount of carbon coming off our bogs that's been drained like this. So the bottom two are, are much better <laughs> examples of uh, peatlands that are in good condition. The one on the left is, is intact, never been cut. But the one on the right is a fantastic sphagnum cover, and that that's a historically cut site. I was out in it yesterday, and you've got just fantastic sphagnum growth, which is really important to get the carbon balance back. So they do come back eventually, but it does take time. Um, so just the lakes, the various lakes we see around Mon around Longford, sorry, say Mon <laughs> um, the Yeah, it's very typically you get these reeds, reed beds and stuff around the lakes. I mean, they're very important for kind of purifying water and stuff before it gets into the open water of the lake. Um, and then at the bottom right is a, a turlock. Obviously, during summertime, it would have been dry, but that whole area would have been inundated with water as a seasonal lake. And all that's left is that depression there where you've got the sinkhole and the water disappears in the summertime. So that's just an example of a turlock we would have surveyed last year. Uh, just some of the pictures of, of plants and animals and stuff we've recorded out there this year is a damselfly, very common in any of the open water wetlands, uh, water mint. Um, there it's, you, you can almost always smell that before you see it on the wetland. And top right there, it's not very, you would know it's anything other than a, a ball of mess, but that, that's a, a nest of caterpillars for a rare spe European protected species, marsh fritillary, which occurs in Monaghan as well. So a couple of sites we've identified as being important for that. Um, so there are just some of the species that we're recording out there. Uh, another thing we do is we evaluate the importance of the, of the, of the various sites we're looking at. And of the 29 sites that we've surveyed the last two years, this is how they've ranked out. And I suppose there's one site there of national importance. Uh, there's four sites of county importance. So they'd be really good examples of the habitat and probably the better examples in the whole county. Um, and then local importance, higher value. So I think those three categories really would be kind of high, high value wetlands. The other two would be of more local importance. So we've got the 17 of them and uh, trying to do my maths, <laughs> 12 of the other. So uh, it just gives you an idea as to what we're finding of the 29 sites we've looked at. So uh, almost half of them are turning out to be of quite high value. Uh, land use threats and impacts. Look, this is something I'm not going to repeat what Mary Catherine's been saying, but it, just to bring it down to Monaghan, the, these impacts do occur there and it is an issue. I mean, the main land use is obviously this agriculture amenity. You know, there's a couple of lovely lakes we visited where there's a lot of fishing and boating and stuff going on. So they are being used uh, quite, quite uh, extensively by local communities. Uh, peat cutting obviously is a major land use. It is uh, reducing, I think, generally the, what we've noticed even in the last three years. Uh, forestry, obviously, some of the peatlands and, and wetlands have been planted for forestry. Uh, not my, I don't think that's happening anymore and that there's no new forestry plantations occurring on wetlands generally, or at least there shouldn't be if, if the policy is uh, working correctly. Uh, Frequent impacts that we're coming across, obviously drainage, nutrient enrichment. So that's where you're getting from farming or maybe forestry or even industry uh, or septic tanks. You get that enrichment and pollution of, of wetlands due to, due to uh, runoff. Uh, habitat loss. Uh, dumping is a, unfortunately a big problem. You'd all know it yourselves if you're in rural Longford. You see it in a lot of places and generally, like Mary Catherine said, they have been underappreciated. It's almost looked upon as a dumping ground. And unfortunately, even this week, we've seen this at a couple of sites. Uh, invasive species. So again, another thing that we're coming across is some of this Japanese knotweeds occurring, particularly along roadsides uh, along the edge of wetlands. Um, and there's another invasive species there, which is down the bottom right. It's a uh, Saracenia, it's a pitcher plant, but Longford seems to be a kind of a, a center for distribution of this. It's a carnivorous plant. I think it's from South America and it was introduced here, but it seems to be doing well in the, the bogs of, Mon of Longford for some reason. So um, that's interesting. But yeah, you can see the photos there. There's uh, construction waste at the edge of that wetland there. And it's just fly tipping really, I suppose, and domestic waste even at other sites. 
and the slumping there on the top right is a raised bog we visited during the week and you know the, the cutting would have continued there until recently and it's it causes major cracks on the peat surface and I mean it's no, no longer functioning as a peatland as such so that that again as I mentioned earlier in relation to climate it's emitting carbon but also from biodiversity point of view it's it's no longer sustaining the wetland habitats. Um, so that's more or less it. I'll just go through a couple of the recommendations. I suppose coming out of our surveys would be, I think it's really important that, you know, you've got that information on the County Council that it be incorporated into developing your land use policy and planning. All of a sudden we've got the good information on the on the condition of the wetlands and, and how they're performing. Uh, I think it's important to continue the surveys just to further establish the status of the resource. Uh, we've looked at 29 sites over the last couple of years, but I mean, there's there's two, there's probably 200 plus that haven't been looked at at all yet. Um, public awareness campaign, I think, would be worthwhile looking at the value of, of long for wetland resource. Again, it's like how do how do you change the whole idea that they're not appreciated for what they are? I think it's we'll have to go through public awareness. I think I think it's improving, but I think there'd be no harm to try and put resources towards something like that. And then I think it's also important to maybe disseminate the results to other agencies and stakeholders. I think it's fantastic that you've gone and taken the lead on this. And I think it'd be great to get other agencies and stakeholders aware of the work you've done and the information that you have in, in relation to your county. So that's it. And um, thanks very much for having us uh, present to you. And we're obviously happy to take questions. Um, hope we didn't go on too long there. Um, but that, that was very, very interesting. And I think, uh, you know, with very, very topical, uh, some of the comments uh, this week with the uh, with the UN report on climate change and the and the man made uh, impacts and the and, and the, the very serious potential outcomes. I mean, it's something that we've known about in one way or another for quite a long time it's it's not a uh, brand new information but it's it certainly brought it together in a very stark and sobering way and I thought it was very interesting that you know I, I think we do underappreciate as you say uh, Patrick um, our wetlands and peatlands uh, for the and they don't appreciate them as resources and um, like that's something that goes back well into the 18th century and um, I think Longford is far, possibly um, an influence on that through Richard Lovell Edgeworth and the and the and the bog commissioners uh, they very much saw them as saw it as wasted ground if you couldn't grow on it you couldn't build on it what was the point of it and i think now we understand more and the fact that you have such a fantastic um, uh, carbon sink there and something that could potentially return to being carbon neutral within 10 years in the case of some of those um some of those peatlands that are uh, that are drained at the moment, and maybe even twenty years that will start that they'll start absorbing it back in, is actually very very interesting, and it's something that's actually quite powerful. It it gives. You know, with all these big changes, I think for everybody, we think, well, what really can we do? I mean, we recycle. We're trying to use the car. You know, we're we're doing what we can, but what effect it is. And just blocking up a few drains, if it can have such a big, uh, such a big impact, you know, it's something that I think landowners uh, in particular could really, really consider. And, you know, we're all here to to help um, give advice on that. Um, and it was great that you mentioned the Marsh Fertillery. I think we got very excited two years ago uh, when when the first report came in, um, because perhaps some people don't know, even 10 years ago, we 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 didn't actually have any formal records um, in the national database for the marsh fertility uh, butterfly in County Longford. We knew they were probably there because the Devil's Bit scabious, which is a, an important plant for them, is there. But they just weren't spotted, or or the the records weren't submitted. And uh, so now we can we're climbing our way back up from the from the from the lower part of the league table on that. And um, are there any other interesting plants? I know that you showed uh, some there, but uh, what was kind of the the most unusual thing that you came across, or something that you were kind of surprised to see or delighted? to see um, uh, I suppose I'm kind of biased towards the bogs myself <laughs> I have a big interest in them I was intrigued to see that carnivorous one that I mentioned the pitcher plant I know it's not native but it's just such an unusual thing and yeah. uh, obviously the yeah I mean all, all those uh, carnivorous plants are just fascinating 
they're, they're fantastic oh. and you know there's plenty of them in abundance out in the bogs in Longford in a way. Yeah, what about yourself Mary Catherine kind of what has been kind of the, one of the more interesting things that you've come across uh, on the surveys? Been a couple of years since I've been out on them I think it was the 2019 one I did but I remember seeing some really lovely uh, lichens on some of the bog sites so they're really uh, nice um, I think matchstick lichens it was the first time I had seen them so they're really beautiful so I just remember those ones because they're just so striking you know they're fantastic and it's uh, yeah. good to see that that the sphagnum cover in some of the in some of the uh, the the, nat- the naturally reclaiming ones uh, are there and Mary Catherine covered it a lot in her video that she performed for us back in uh, May for Biodiversity Week and uh, for those of you with an interest in World War One and are on our um, um, Longford at War website we know how important sphagnum is as a as 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 a um, it's a great absorber. It'll it'll beat your sham wows and your 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 microfibers uh, any day of the week. Um. So this year you were saying we were saying earlier that you were out uh you're back out on site again this year um in County Longford just starting uh this week. And so what area are we concentrating on this year? You're just muted at the moment. Yeah, I think it's mainly the Camden River catchment, I think. Um, we were asked to kind of prioritise that. And uh, yeah, so we're up around Banali and over towards Granard and those places I've been getting familiar with the last few days. I know on day three, you're trying to start recognising places because you've driven past them <laughs> three times. So yeah, and look, I suppose one of the things about it is, it, and it's kind of tricky, is the whole access to these places. And mm. some of them are, are private landowners. And, you know, it is something we need to be very conscious of when we're visiting them and it it's quite time consuming just getting that uh identifying who the landowner is and in, in some instances we may we may not get there but mm. we tend to you know if it's kind of easily accessible we, we plow on but it's something that i'm you know, increasingly aware of but i mean 99 percent of the landowners are just more than happy to let us on and you know in in so <laughs> it gets frustrating from us because we get chatting to the farmers and next thing you're there 20 minutes later and you still no work done <laughs> talk and carry football and whatever else they want to talk about. So. And thanks yeah. so much to 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 Patrick and to Mary Catherine for a really informative and illuminating look at our wetlands here um, of di- of all of all stripes here in County Longford. And uh, we're delighted that you've been able to come on board with us. And um, if people wanted to see um, the the results of the survey, um, I know that we host the um, the annual reports that you have. We have them on longfordlibrary.ie within the heritage section. There's a projects and there's a folder for the wetlands. But if somebody wanted to, uh, you guys have a really interesting interactive map and you also host uh, some of the information as well. So how can the public uh, and interested people actually interact with the survey? Yeah, so there is, um, we have a wetland map of Ireland. If, if you go onto our website, there's a link to it. And that d- displays the results of all these surveys in the one in the one platform or one place. So it's, it's handy and it's getting more information the whole time as it becomes available. Uh, the other thing that's there is we, we do have an app available to the public to be able to download where they can take a photograph and submit that to the wetland map of Ireland. And that could be the feature photograph for any particular site. So to encourage people to go on there and have a look at that, all those resources on, on our website. That's fantastic. I, I, I actually wasn't aware of the app, so I, I'll have to make sure to download it and add it to the others, like the like the uh, National Biodiversity Data Centre um, um, <laughs> recording yeah. service, of course. So if you see the picture app out there, get onto um, the National Bi- the Biodiversity Ireland uh, app as well, and let us know where it might be turning up. Uh, that's fantastic. That's really, really good. And the the the, the map is excellent. It really is. Uh, we use it a lot. And uh, we will, of course, be feeding the information in due course to um, heritagemaps.ie, which is a Heritage Council um, uh, aggregate um, interactive mapping service. So you're able to layer all of the different um, information on that. But uh, we, I really like using uh, your guys' map. It's really, really useful. Right. Um, so I think that is uh, that wraps up uh, the tonight's event. Um, thank you again to Patrick and Mary Catherine, and thank you for everyone else for joining us. And we hope that you got some uh, great information and found it very interesting. And if you want to find out more, go to Wetlands uh, to the Wetland Surveys Ireland website onto longfordlibrary.ie. 
for more information and also check out uh, the, the the videos that we made for biodiversity week with mary catherine in the in the rain it lived up the wetlands certainly lived up to their name <laughs> that day and um, this video will be on you on the Longford Library Heritage and Archives YouTube uh, channel um, in a playlist uh, titled um, Heritage Week 2021, but also a biodiversity playlist. And you'll be able to see the May um, uh, video there and also on the Longford Heritage and Archives Facebook page. So I think for that, we'll wrap up and uh, thank you all for joining. Us and look forward thank to you. The field. Thanks, Maurice. Thank, thank you. Good Thank night. Thank you all. Take Good care. Night. Bye, everyone.